Thank you. So um, this is Senate Government Operations. It is uh, Wednesday, February 3rd, and we are going to hear today um, a S, um, one, S-147, which is um, a bill about language access plans. And what I'm going to do is because most of you are have don't join our, our um, committee very often, so I'm going to have us introduce ourselves, and then I'll um, tell you how the the process works, if that's okay. So I'm Jeanette White and I am from Wyndham County. Hi all, I'm Anthony Polina, Washington County. Brian Collimore representing the Rutland County District. Allison Clarkson representing the Windsor District. Asia Ram Hinsdale, Chittenden County. Email from Linda who's present with us, who has to leave at two. Yep. Sorry. Yes. Um, yes, Gail did tell me that. So um, the, way, the way this works is that we will take your testimony and if people have any questions, we will um, ask you questions. And Linda, I do understand that you have a time constraint and so we're going to start with you. So tell us what you have to tell us and welcome. Thank you so much everyone for um, honoring my time. Um, my time limitation. So let me tell you a little bit about myself and why I think my voice is worth to be here. So um, I'm an immigrant and I'm um, also an interpreter for a very, very long time. I become an interpreter um, since 2004. And since then I've been very involved in the community and I become a social worker. Um, I went back to social work school in 2008 and um, now I am, fast forward, I am a, a child therapist at the Community Health Center of Burlington and also the president, chapter president for the National Association of Social Workers. And uh, interpreter, why, you know, and that's exactly why, why I'm here because interpreter has um, long been um, kind of a off, you know, we don't we don't really have a career path right now. We don't have a lot of focus on us in in terms of training and uh, um, um, importancy, and so to speak. Not a lot of providers know how to work with an interpreter. Um, we see I have uh, many different kind of experience in medical setting, legal setting, or court setting. Um, a very very level of understanding about interpreters. And I think this law is important because it put um, a focus on um, if we, you know, if the state are used to interpreter and having a standard and, you know, focusing on um, this is a, this is professional, this is a profession, this is a career, and we could be able to create a better, way better um, 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 retention and, and um, for, people of color or people who speak um, different language to stay. Um, and I can also tell you how important it is to use an interpreter, right? I think go back to the basic education of people don't even know how to request an interpreter because either we don't require it, either we don't, you know, we don't, um, um, we don't think that's necessary. And this is all about social justice, racial justice. Um, I have heard DCF um, court hearing has not, clearly has not have been used in Tokyo's. Um, that's very troubling. And uh, um, um, luckily I have friends in connection there. So I've been working with, um, um, the DCF educator then do some training with them. Um, but again, I feel like this is not just, a, this is not just a, I, a law to just put it as a, a paper. I think it would, it would trigger, I hope that would trigger a longer term of system for interpreters, standards for interpreters, and more so insurance to pay for interpreters services. Medicaid reimburse fair like a, a, a better like a affordable way for, for small for small um, practices. 
or organization or individual doctors of us to use interpreters. Um, um, so um, I think that I didn't come totally prepare a statement, but I'm talking from my raw and firsthand experience and being both in um, um, the provider side and the interpreter side and also person who, who um, 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 on the receiver side, I should say, on the receiver side and the providing side. So I, uh, I would appreciate that, that um, this could uh, pass through. And um, any questions for me? I'm sorry, I'm babbling. Yes, I, I do have a question and then I'll open it up to the rest of the committee if they have. Do you, are, do you get it reimbursed from any systems at all when you um, act as an interpreter for people either in the courts or the Department of Health or any place? As an interpreter? Yeah, so, I mean, yes. So this is USCLI uh, and ALV who are the two major employer of the um, um, interpretation services. They usually they hire us and they do, I do always get paid if I do interpretation. Um, but that is oftentimes a organization or community health center, they are federal have qualified, they have to provide, they have the grant, the hospital, whatnot. Um, if I'm a small business, if I'm become a private practice and want to see a person who doesn't speak English and want to have an interpreter, I have to pay USAI and ALV out of my pocket. Um, if I don't have med, if if I don't bill Medicaid, and Medicaid's billing is that tiny, not a lot of people um, willing to go there to do that. And private insurance, you can just forget about it. And that is really not helping increase mental health services for mm -hmm. people who don't speak English. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, does any other committee member have a, a question here honoring her time? <laughs> Senator Clarkson. Thank you, Linda. Um, it, this is, I think this is important. Currently now, if, if someone requests, I know you said one of the problems is, is not everybody un understands that they can request translation services. But if a person does request translation services, the the state or you were talking about DCF, DCF is required to provide them, are they not? Yeah, they are. However, the education piece is uh, um, not, you know, a lot of people don't don't know where to get it. And the idea, you know, and it is, even though there's laws out there, the civil rights laws has clearly stated that it is, you know, um, we, uh, um, anyone who receives federal funding has to provide interpreters, right? I think the emphasis on let's make it emphasis. We have a pro we in it the protocol. It need like a, a education, not just one time. You know, renewal, um, new employee orientation, like all those. I, I again, this is a this is a um, I shouldn't say, but this is shit would be able to create an example. You know, oftentimes right. someone just needs to step and, up into their system. Yeah. And do you, given that you know this system so well and the community well, how would, it, you know, at some point, I think, I know your time is short now, but it would, I think we'd appreciate uh, if you'd be kind of to send us some of your best thinking on how we could best educate uh, both, you know, uh, and, and plan, I guess that's a piece of this bill really, is, is how we plan uh, prospectively how we to, to educate uh, everybody who could ask. I mean, I think education is a key core piece of this work. Yeah, yeah. And I think Amelia, um, Amelia and um, um, uh, Allison, they are, we work together in a group and um, it is not just me saying, I feel like. It is a community-based um, 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 uh, feedback to the state and to the agency. And uh, you will have no um, trouble 
to, I mean, Amila and Alison will tell you more about what our group does. And um, they will be, I think they will be um, uh, very clear uh, and will be very helpful on, on answering your question. So I, I'm just gonna make, I know you have to run, I'm just gonna make one, I suspect that when I think about it, I suspect that um, certain agencies or departments might um, not uh, be forceful in telling people that they can have an interpreter because it would be much cheaper for them to say, um, well, your uncle can translate for you or your, your mother or somebody can. And we know that that's, that's a problem, but I suspect that, that there is that tendency to do it that. happens all the time, thank you. And that is the education piece, right? Who's going to reinforce the law? We have clearly, you know, this is a human right issue and this is mm -hmm. a, a civil right law staying there, but people still do it. So how could a stay, Vermont, um, or how did the state law help pushing the gap? Mm -hmm. um, I actually just, I'm not going to name name, but just two months ago, I call, I call our local, small um, 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 counseling group um, um, that um, we're going to uh, say that we, uh, we can see this patient because we are not going to provide uh, interpreters. And um, I was, this is not right. And I called them out and they completely changed the story. Yeah. Um, but you know what? I don't even want to send my patient there anymore. Yeah. You clearly not. I mean, even though you provide interpreter, you clearly doesn't know how to how to provide a adequate, culturally appropriate, adequate uh, uh, mental health um, services for, for my patients. So, thank you. Now, that your last statement also was very um, telling. So, thank you so much, and I do appreciate your being here and we will probably ta be taking this on up again and we'll send you an invite the next time and whether you wanna weigh in again or not, but we will send you an invite. Anytime, Keisha um, know me and she knows what I've been doing with um, NASW. In fact, we are doing a very big piece on, um, you probably would, would, would hear that, but uh, we'll be, I'll be, I'll be in touch and don't, don't be afraid to, um, Send me an email, reach out to me. Thanks, Linda. Good to see Thank you, you. Allison. See you soon. See you Thursday. <laughs> Bye. So I understand that Amanda wants to go last. Is that right? If that is okay. So I don't have to tell you all my statistics. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it's fine. However, how the schedule here is kind of up to you. So Thank you. How, where would we, who wants to go next, I guess is my, okay. And are you, you just say Vermont Language Justice Project. Are you Kimberly? I'm Allison Siga. You're, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. I haven't figured out how to change that name. I'll do that. Okay. So I, okay. I, have a, I have a statement that I'm just going to read out. Um, and then I, I, I'll send a copy of it to Jillian afterwards. A uh, Gail. Sorry to Gail afterwards. Okay. Um, my name is Alison Seeger, and I'm the director of the Vermont Language Justice Project. The project began in March 2020, when the country was beginning to shut down from COVID, and I realized that the only information available to Vermonters about this public health emergency was in English, both locally and nationally. I launched the Vermont Multilingual Coronavirus Task Force a volunteer effort to create educational videos with basic facts about COVID-19 in multiple languages. The first video was recorded by phone, uploaded to a new YouTube channel and shared with Somali and Somali Bantu contacts through social media and WhatsApp. The task force of over 40 community partners who worked with refugees and immigrants in Chittenden County met at first twice a week to discuss how information could be shared about the ever-changing nature of the virus and the shutdown of the state of Vermont in a format for people who had limited English proficiency and struggled to navigate the internet. Over the next 21 months, we worked with translators to produce videos and sound files in more than 10 languages. We put out our messages through WhatsApp, a free texting service, Facebook, public access TV, case managers, working with refugees and immigrants. 
We put our media out through both the Winooski and the Burlington School District robocall system. So in the same way that you would get a message that there is a snow day, you would also now get a message, for example, about how the quarantine rules for testing positive for COVID had changed in your language. Fast forward to February today, uh, we received back in November a grant from the CDC through the Vermont Department of Health. And we are currently writing scripts and making videos and sound files in 14 languages. ASL, Arabic, Burmese, Dari, French, English, Kurundi, Mai Mai, Nepali, Pashto, Spanish, Somali, Swahili, and Vietnamese. We've been able to include the Pashto and Dari languages as our new Afghan arrivals are coming to make Vermont their home. As of today, we've put out over 71 videos, each in up to 14 different languages, and to date have had over 49,000 hits on our YouTube channel. Initially, we just focused on Chittenden County, but since receiving the grant, we are now reaching out to the whole of Vermont. So we're now including Addison County, where there is a significant Spanish-speaking population, and are reaching out to Brattleboro in the south through the school district there and the new refugee resettlement project. So what have we been learning? We are learning that the demand is insatiable not only for critical health information regarding COVID, but also to help with navigation of children in schools. We've just put out five different videos in our 14 languages, that's 70 videos in total, on how to do the rapid antigen self-test that are being used all over the state in our schools in particular. To date, since the end of December, we've had over 11,000 views of these videos. Schools are using these videos daily. We've been told time and time again by many individuals as well as service providers that our project has saved lives. If we'd not been able to mobilize in the way we did so quickly, providing crucial health information in our multiple languages, I do believe many more lives would have been lost to COVID. We've learned that there is no project like ours in the country. There is no one consistently putting out information in the many languages that we have in the format that we have about COVID. Just think when the vaccines came out in the winter of 2021, we were asked by the Department of Health in Florida if they could put our Spanish video about the vaccines on the website. Florida wanted our Spanish video. Just last week, the Health Department of North Carolina has asked if they could share all our videos on the self-testing kits. On Sunday, the Department of Health of the state of California requested use of our videos in Pashto and Dari for their new Afghan arrivals. We have been asked if we can do videos for the Department of Education, the Department of Mental Health, for housing authorities, legal services, for school districts, and for various nonprofits. Just to be clear, when I say we, it is me and my team of 11 translators who work many jobs and send me their sound files sometimes at two in the morning. So what do we need? The state lacks a comprehensive system and detailed language access plan where Vermonters with limited English proficiency can participate fully in the services offered by government agencies, health and education in particular, but also public safety. Our method of working has been extremely successful as shown by the data I've just shared. Videos and sound files shared in a multitude of ways have saved lives and the plan needs to consider a multi-pronged approach to language access that goes beyond traditional translations on websites that few people are able to access. So we are working on COVID and this need has illuminated all the other needs that have never been addressed. If you don't speak English, and your doctor orders a colonoscopy, how do you know what to do if you can't read the instructions on the medicine that they give you before you have the procedure? If your daughter is diagnosed with ADHD, how are you gonna know best how to help them if you don't have clear information about the, what, what the diagnosis means in an accessible format? If there's an urgent statewide public safety concern or even a local one, an ice storm, a heat wave, a burst water main, how is that information disseminated what languages are that information disseminated in? We need to go beyond checking boxes, be putting Google Translate up onto our websites as a solution to engaging folks with limited English proficiency. What do I recommend? I recommend a detailed access plan that is flexible in its approach to embrace the ever-changing needs of the community, 
the community of multilingual Vermonters, as well as the technology that can be used to be most effective. I recommend more funding, more flexibility in spending. If we are in agreement that we need to develop a comprehensive language access plan, we need to fund it adequately. We need to design a system of delivery and build capacity so we have enough trusted translators, content developers, and distribution that meets people where they're at. We welcome people from all over the world to Vermont, and it's something that I love about this state, which has been my home now for over 25 years. But we need to ensure that people who have limited English proficiency are given information in a language that they understand and a format that is accessible so that they can lead informed lives while they navigate their new homeland. The end. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. I wasn't sure if that was a, a pause or the end. So thank you. It was the end. I, it was the end. <laughs> I do have a a kind of a question, and I I wasn't sure I um, understood exactly when you were talking about the technology and the mm -hmm. the kind of interpretive. Um, I understand there's some apps that interpret that translate. And I, so I wasn't sure I understand what your approach and your support okay. of that is, as opposed to having people actually um, do the, the videos or the, the right. robocalls. So, so uh, what we know about Google Translate is for some languages, it's kind of okay, maybe French, maybe Spanish. But when you start looking at other languages, Nepali, Burmese, uh, we've, we've been told, over and over again, that uh, if you just put in the language, it put it in English and press the button, what comes out in Burmese is not, not only makes no sense, but it's actually kind of dangerous because it really makes no sense. And so it's actually worse than it actually being in English. And we think that's true of many, many of the languages that are spoken uh, in Chittenden County and in Vermont in general. Um, and many of the languages aren't translatable. There is no Mai Mai. Mai Mai is, a, is not a written language, and Mai Mai is spoken by a lot of the Somali Bantu who have been resettled here in Chittenden County. Um, so we don't recommend Google Translate at all. I mean, if you're going to use translation services, it's best to send your information out to uh, trusted translation organizations. However, the reason that we're doing this in video format and in a sound file, sound bites, is because so many people can't access the internet. I mean, you have to be able to read English to find, it's a bit like, you know, when you make a phone call and they say, if you don't speak English, press one. <laughs> so you have to understand what that means right from the word go, you know. Um, so it's the same kind of thing in order to navigate the internet, to find the translated materials, you have to definitely have a certain level of proficiency of the English language to get there in the first place. So what we provide is like links to, uh, you know, uh, to videos which uh, get sent through text or get put out on social media. And all you have to do is click that link and it takes you straight to the video about the specific subject, which could be how to do an on-go rapid test or how to, uh, what to do if you test positive for COVID um, and countless other things. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I, I just have one follow-up and then I see yeah. uh, Senator Rom Hinsdale has her hand up, but so it, it makes sense to me that for um, things that might be like, how to use the test or what to do if you're going to have a colonoscopy or things like that, that, that we can predict, but how do you, how do you quickly put something out where, when there's an emergency, if there's a, an ice storm or a hazardous waste spill Absolutely. or something like that? That's, that's a really great question. And um, I, I think back to, I live in Burlington. I think back to a couple of summers ago when there was some significant water problem and we were told not to drink the water for like 24 hours and there was nothing. So what, what, what local communities who spoke different languages, they got together, they quickly put out a video. Uh, I remember Ali Dang did that, Dang did that, and he sent it out through his, his social network. So mm -hmm. one thing that 
I wasn't aware of when I when I moved here was that if you come from a community where you all speak a similar language, which is not the dominant language, there's so many informal networks. Like people have WhatsApp groups of like 50, 100 people, and oh. you can quickly you can quickly access those groups. That's how we did it through that. So, and, and the same with schools, you know, Burlington and Winooski School District have uh, all, their, um, all their students uh, put together through language. So if we needed to send a message out to all the Nepalese students, we send it to them and they plug it into their system and boom, it goes out. And that's what we do now. We currently do that in Burlington and Winooski. And we're able to reach thousands of thousands of kids that way. So I think that is a way forward. And I think we need to be really mindful and flexible in how we do produce public safety information. There's potential systems in place. Some of them are informal, but some of them are formal. And we need to be able to think about how to utilize them. Thank and you. The, that was uh, yeah. And, and the written word isn't isn't the way to go. Mm -hmm. We're learning that over and over again. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. That was helpful. Uh, yeah. Sarah Ram Hinsdale, did you have a? Yeah, thank you, Allison. And really, you did save lives. And toward the beginning of the pandemic, I just remember reaching out to a lot of agencies and saying, what are you saying in other languages? <laughs> because people can't wait for this information. So you really filled a, a need. Um, I have informally talked to a lot of agencies about the importance of WhatsApp, um, that it has, you know, it's an international a tool that's often used to do government broadcasts in other countries. Can you speak a little bit more about the trusted platforms or communication channels that you've tried to get information out and how you... Yeah, sure. I mean, we, we use basically use WhatsApp. Uh, uh, um, a lot of uh, um, case managers who work for Amila's organization as well as ALLV uh, use WhatsApp to just communicate. Would you with, tell me what with, that um, is again? Sure, it's an app on your phone and it's a free texting service. So as long as you have Wi-Fi, you can text. You don't have to have a uh, necessarily have a phone plan to do it. So it's it's a great free okay. resource. And that's how I can contact my friends in England, uh, you know, for no charge. We don't you don't have to have an iPhone, you know, with FaceTime, you have to have the same type of phone. Um Oh, Amila's putting something in there. Awesome. Thank you, Amila. Um, so that's that's the main one. Uh, but also Facebook. Uh, a lot of people communicate through Facebook. Um, I think those are the two main ones. And I'm, I'm excited to hear that government agencies are using WhatsApp. Um, I didn't know that. That's, that's good. That's progressive. No, I, I think so. Um, Department of Public Safety said they understood the need to do that. I, Gamila might know more if they've started to do that, but they at least are getting it. And I said that to emergency communication specifically. Excellent. But, Excellent. Yeah. So Great. then we need to have the people who could translate the messages and then have them broadcast it that way. Yeah. And then we need to uh, desegregate people by language so that people can get the right language. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Senator Clarkson. So Allison, uh, I'm another Allison. It's lovely to have another Allison in this committee. <laughs> Welcome. And, Thank and you. I'm only a half Brit, so it's lovely to have a full one. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, I, I, I applaud you in my other committee. I'm vice chair of Senate Economic Development and your entrepreneurial uh, social justice gifts have been combined here. And I, it's so impressive to see that because you're you're acting quickly to fill a huge need and you've created something. So I have to ask you some economic development questions too. And one relates to Linda's testimony. Uh, you employ 11 translators. Well, first of all, are you set up as a for-profit or I assume a nonprofit? So, so just to be clear, when this project started, it was me. I worked full-time for Howard Center. Yeah, I happened uh, to be a filmmaker on the side. So every weekend for probably the first 18 months was spent doing this work pretty much for free. We managed to get money from the Department of Health um, and that was funneled through Association of Africans Living in Vermont. They were our fiscal sponsors at the time. Uh, when we got this uh, money from the through the CDC, uh, um, I um, asked uh, my colleagues at CCTV, uh, 
community television in Germany Bye. County if, if they would become my fiscal sponsor. So now uh, I'm employed through them. The money gets channeled through them. And that's a 501c3. And that's a great, it's a great connection because uh, they can help with the production. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's great. And I guess my second question goes to Linda's request that translator i do you employ the translators or do you hire them as independent contractors and if so are they it goes to linda's question about benefits it, so someday i would assume you would have hoped to have enough income to actually hire them and provide benefits but at the moment they're independent <laughs> contractors is that right absolutely they're independent contractors they get paid by the job so yeah. they will get paid depending on the the complexity of the script that we're asking them to do and the length of the script, they will get paid by the job. Yeah. Yeah. And they get paid well because it's a really hard task to do. It's a hard task to, and, and, and we're often asking them to do things in a very quick turnaround. So I don't know if you remember when the Johnson and Johnson vaccine was taken off the market just for five days, we had messaging out within 24 hours to tell people about that, which was nobody else was able to do that. The department of health has a very long procedure. You know, they send stuff out for translation. It then has to get, uh, checked by somebody else and by the time they got it back it was over and done with johnson johnson was back on the market again you know so right yeah no great yeah. we well uh, we applaud you right thank I mean, you appreciate bra that. Brava. thank you thank you are there other questions now for allison yes senator polina i don't have a question i just want to say that it sounds like an amazing project you should be really proud of yourself and your thank other you. volunteers it really is, sounds incredibly effective thank you. really thank appreciate, you. appreciate it, it. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. It's and been although a, it's I, been a great thing. I hate to say this, you should be charging those other states. I know that's what everybody said. It all suddenly happened so quickly. And I think we need to figure that out. Absolutely. It seems like yeah. there should be some kind of grant funding to push it out on a national level. There should be, should be some vehicle to make it possible to yeah, do that. We need to figure that out whenever I, I mean, I only work four days a week. So when I have a spare moment, we're certainly yeah, gonna right. look, we're gonna certainly look into that. Yeah, but you're right. We should be charging. <laughs> when you have a spare moment, you should rest too. <laughs> I look forward to that. <laughs> well, it's it's very ARPA eligible, so maybe we can be thinking about this. Oh, yeah, so, sure. can we hear from Amila and then? Um, did I say that right, Amila? I want to say Amelia, uh, but yeah, of course I'm not. You did. It, uh, that was perfect. Most okay. people can't do that <laughs> on the first try. Thank you. Thank so, you so much, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, Senator Ron Hinsdale, for introducing this bill and for this opportunity to talk to you about this life-saving life um, service that um, Allison and I and others um, have been involved with um, over many years. So I'm Amila Majanovic. I'm the director at USCRI Vermont, which is the Vermont Refugee Resettlement Program. Uh, just a quickly about myself, I arrived to Vermont as a refugee from Bosnia in 95 with some English. I was fortunate enough to take private lessons back home. And when I arrived, I actually was able to carry on a basic um, conversation. And, you know, within a couple months, I was able to take classes at CCV and the rest is history. So knowing English, speaking English, having access to information is life-changing. And I, I'm old fashioned, so I have a PowerPoint presentation for you all. So I'm just going to share my screen quickly and um, really go quickly through it. Um, I, I do need to say that we have a refugee arrival at 325 this afternoon, and I'm charged with picking up a warm meal. So I will need to go uh, by probably quarter of three, no, no later than quarter of three. So I will go quickly through my presentation. And again, thank you so much for the opportunity. So um, I will start with a quote by one of my favorites, Noam Chomsky, which says, 
The fact is that if you have not developed language, you simply don't have access to most of human experience. And if you don't have access to experience, then you're not going to be able to think properly. And I think, you know, it's, it's as basic as, as this quote, not having access to information in your language and in a cult culturally appropriate manner does n is an equity issue, which Linda talked about. It's a social justice issue. It simply is a um, humanity issue. And, and all of us at, as Vermonters feel, you know, are very passionate about all of those is issues and want all Vermonters to have access to um, information and opportunities and be successful. So just quickly, I wanted to show you a breakdown of refugee arrivals over the past uh, six years. About a thousand people um, arrived to Vermont from um, all over the, the globe. So from about uh, 386 individuals uh, in uh, fiscal year 16 to uh, as of this week, actually, we will be at 173 individuals, which includes 150 Afghans. This is a breakdown by country, fiscal year um, on across the top and countries of origin. And you can see that um, in our, you know, little mighty state of Vermont, we have individuals from um, a dozen different countries. And this is not an exhaustive list because refugees have been coming to Vermont since the 80s. These are um, some of the languages that are spoken in our state. Um, again, there are other, uh, other languages which uh, did not make it to the list. Korean, for example, um, Japanese is there, and, um, and there certainly are others um, which uh, haven't made it to the list. And then Linda also talked about um, the um, Title VI and the Civil Rights um, Act of 1964, and I'm sure my friend Amanda Garces will talk more about that. It's the law. Title VI six prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, color, and national origin in any program or activity that receives federal um, funds or financial assistance. So the, um, this effort to um, have a, a law in place that will ensure access, language access in the state of Vermont is way overdue, I would say. And I'm, I, you know, picked this uh, uh, line from the actual bill, the information outlines the agency's provision of life-saving services and the steps an individual should take to access those services. So the life-saving services should, should be broadly interpreted to include all state administered and state funded services where substantial harm could occur if there's not linguistic access to information, even if death is not imminent. So what are some of the examples of services? The, the obvious one, which Linda also talked about is Medicaid funded services and access to those services. Uh, one quick example is setting up an SSTA um, transportation. Water and ice safety. Allison talked about that uh, recently, a couple of days ago, in in a town in Chittenden County. I won't name any names. There wasn't a, a water issue, and um, there was a you know public announcement um, in English. So, you know, I raised the question: What about um, you know your uh, residents who are you know non English speak speakers? hunting safety, lead poisoning, public safety messaging beyond COVID-19. So, you know, disease outbreak, active shooter lockdowns, se severe uh, weather warnings, court systems. Um, and, and I will say that um, the courts have, have done a, a really good job 
um, in ensuring that um, interpretation is available and um, it is, uh, we work with courts throughout Vermont and, you know, provide interpretation and translation services. However, at times, um, you know, not both, both parties have interpretation available. So it becomes, um, it becomes really uh, tricky. It's a conflict of interest. Um, so ensuring that both parties have uh, interpretation services, law enforcement, public safety, and so on. Um, the uh, USCRI, formerly VRP, has the longest running interpretation and translation uh, service program in the state. All of our interpreters are professionally trained and they're bound by uh, ethics, including um, National Council Interpreting in Healthcare, International Medical Interpreting Association, and Vermont Judiciary. The art of interpreting requires the interpreter to be accurate, to uh, be bound by confidentiality and be impartial, and to stay within their role boundaries. We have about 60 on-call employees. They're not independent contractors. They're on-call employees who speak among them about 25 plus languages. Um, we're able to provide telephonic interpretation. And since the pandemic, we have utilized Zoom, WhatsApp, uh, but the golden standard remains inter in-person interpretation. And then translation that is a uh, written form. Um, these are just some of the state agencies that we uh, work with. We have a contract with uh, Buildings and General Services, which covers AHS agencies to provide interpretation and translation. Um, uh, also Department of Mo uh, Motor Vehicles. So as of this was two years ago, it was also, um, it was another bill that was introduced and passed um, now the, the uh, test, the driver's license test, is translated into 10 top languages spoken in Vermont. And actually, uh, we are now able to have an interpreter, live interpreter, uh, during road test. And uh, these are just some community providers that also utilize interpretation services through both USCRI and ALV. Questions to share that graphic. Thank you, and I'm sorry I rushed through that. No, that was great. Thank you. I um, do you do you also have ASL interpreters? We do not. We have a Nepali sign language interpreter, but we do not have ASL interpreters. Is that something that we need? I mean, that, yeah, because that would be not necessarily under your, under your Correct. jurisdiction, but that is something we also need to look at. Amanda oh. was going to speak a little bit oh. to that. Okay. Yeah. And, and some people who speak other languages need it. I mean, it's not. Yes. Yep. I, I will just tell you a little, my niece is, um, right now works in the State Department in the Chinese division. And she spent a lot of time in China and did some um, Mandarin ASL, whatever, mm -hmm. whatever that means. <laughs> I'm not yes. entirely sure, but she was working with a whole bunch of little kids in the in where she lived. Yeah, wonderful. Um, yes, Senator Ron Hensel. I just want to say out loud, you know, I think in both the case of, of Allison and Amila, um, it's, you know, it's going to take resources, not just to contract with folks and interpret, but a layer of resources on top to make sure that these organizations can support this, can um, have interpreters that speak to government services in a mm -hmm. way that y y there's a lot of certification that goes in. So, uh, you know, I didn't know if you wanted, I mean, I think that's part of the reason for the language access plan. Otherwise the contracts are sometimes 
come do this rather than Mm -hmm. we need to make sure that there's an ongoing relationship. And I didn't know if you could speak to that. Yes. Thank you so much. That's such a critical piece. Uh, it, it, It is one thing to have a contract in place. It's, it's a very different thing to number one, have qualified and trained interpreters who can continue to work as Linda said, you know, this is in Vermont, it's not a profession because there, there isn't enough um, demand. And, um, and then for providers to, uh, to have um, access to education um, and uh, which, which is so critical and to understand how to work with interpreters, what are the, you know, uh, you know, you have a pre-session and you, during the session, this is, you do this, and this is the, you know, it's really an art. And then to make sure that um, they, they rely on professionally trained interpreters and not family members or, or friends or, or neighbors. Um, so to, and, and to offer those training opportunities, um, you know, at sort of regular basis, but those agencies need to commit, uh, you know, with every new hire, it will be part of your onboarding. Um, and Alice and Linda and, and a few other of us um, were fortunate enough last summer to get a small grant from Department of Mental Health to offer training, um, which included uh, working with interpreters. And um, uh, it was really well received. And, you know, there was... Uh, appetite for more sort of higher level, you know, where, where do we go from here? So this may be a really naive question. And I hope to goodness that it doesn't offend anybody. But I know with ASL, for example, that most of the ASL interpreters are not themselves deaf. So they don't really understand the, the deaf community and how that, I mean, it, it's hard to understand a community that you're not a part of. So is it important for interpreters to be p- a, a part of, to come from a particular community for which they're interpreting? Does that make any sense to you? That does that make, yes, it, it yes. Um, you know, I would say that, what is important is that the individual has uh, their language skills in both the target language and um, the foreign language is at the level, at a certain level, high, high level. Uh, whether it's important that they, they come from that particular uh group, cultural group, um, I would say not necessarily. Um, I'm just thinking about some of our interpreters. Um, You know, they are, and and most of them, I would say probably 90%, if not more, are members of those different uh, refugee or immigrant communities. But we do have a number of interpreters who are not who studied language in in college and, you know, had training, interpreter training, and, um, you know, are are doing this um, as, you know, as sort of a a side gig. They must need to have some um, understanding of the culture, though. Oh, not just the language. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Can I just add one thing, which is, I think there's two definitions of community, community that you live in and the uh, the community that you're part of. So my point being that I've I've experienced times uh, when I was a social worker that uh, people didn't want somebody from their community to be their interpreter because mm-hmm. this is such a small, yeah. such a small state, and the information was so personal. Uh, I'm thinking particularly of a court situation where they actually hired somebody from New Hampshire who was completely mm-hmm. outside of our community because of the nature of the offense and stuff. So there's community locally, and then there's uh, and there's and there's culture. I think some of those are can be 
you know, those are, those are often different things. Yeah, yeah. that's true. Um, I'm, I, do you have a, a comment, Senator? And then I'm going to run, get to Amanda here before we run out of time. Yeah, so number one, I've just seen court interpreters interpreting for both parties, which is really bad practice. So, you know, we need to make sure that is, is known to the court system that that's not okay. Um, I did, when I worked at Steps to End Domestic Violence, you'd have someone walk in and say, I'm the only person they trust you still should get a phone interpreter to make sure that really is the only person they trust. That could be someone who's really close with their husband. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that is never good practice. The third thing I'll say is when I was a preschool teacher at Burlington Children's Space, um, the, there was a young boy whose parents were, spoke German and um, Spanish from Guatemala. And the little boy was struggling so much and everybody thought that he was just having trouble integrating all the languages. And it took them over a year to realize that he was deaf. And so, you know, a, a lot of times common sense just sometimes goes out the window. When we hear people speak other languages, we think like, that's just a cultural thing, you know, but you also have to treat that young person or that child, you know, like um, they could use a range of services. And sometimes we lose track of that when we have cultural barriers. Thank you. So can we jump here to Amanda? And if, thank, thank you, Mel, and you are welcome to stay with us, both of you, or not. If you, you, I know you have to go get a hot meal. I do. Yes. I do have to jump off, but thank you so much for this opportunity. Yes, and thank you. I'm happy to come back. Thank Likewise. You. Thanks for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Amanda. Thank you so much for having me. Um, for the record, my name is Amanda Garces. I am the Director of Policy, Education, and Outreach for the Vermont Human Rights Commission. And um, thank you, Chair White and members of, of the committees to have me here today. Um, as you know, the Human Rights Commission is, uh, is here to promote full civil and human rights in Vermont. We enforce the laws over which we have jurisdiction through investigation, conciliations, and litigation, as well as providing education and training. It develops and advances policies and legislation relating to the protection of the most vulnerable Vermonters. As we open the door to refugees and we welcome immigrants to work in our farms, as we strive to diversify our state, we must also start providing access to our agencies and departments. Today, I'm very happy to offer testimony on this, requiring state agencies to create language access plans. As you hear my accent, I'm very passionate about this subject. Uh, we believe this begins the path for a conversation around language justice. And language justice is a term that has been used for decades and is evolving. Essentially, it's the path for respecting every individual's fundamental language rights to be able to communicate, understand, and be understood in the language in which they prefer and feel most articulate and powerful. I do sound a lot smarter than in Spanish sometimes. Uh, there is dignity that comes with being able to explain yourself in your language. Um, this is really a tool to advance human rights in our state. Um, it offers a vision of society, and this is a quote from a great toolkit that was developed on language justice. Um, it offers a vision of society that honors language and culture as fundamental human rights, and which does not settle for providing more people with access to the status quo, rather alters institutions to provide space for full democratic participation. Vermonters who are foreign born make up almost 5% of the population. And that was from the Census Bureau in 2018, that was 30,813 immigrants. U.S. born Vermonters primarily speak English and only 0.2% of that population speak it less than very well. Comparatively, approximately 30.8% of Vermonters who are foreign born report speaking English less than very well. That was data from the Migration Policy Institute. Vermonters who were born in a foreign country are essential to our economic well being. They add more than half a billion dollars to our economy. That's 608.4 million in spending power after tax. In 2018, 9,803 immigrant workers comprised 6% of the labor force. Immigrants in Vermont contribute to hundreds of millions of dollars in taxes. 
194.2 million in federal taxes and 88.9 million in state and local taxes in 2018. These are outdated statistics, but you get the point. Um, hopefully we'll get more statistics. Lastly, immigrant business owners generate millions in revenue. 1,335 immigrant business owners account for 3% of all self-employed of Vermont residents and generated 25.7 million in business incomes. That just to say that we need to be able to think through this as well. Um, with that, I would like to add that in any access plans and language justice conversations, we must include our deaf and hard of hearing community. I should say that Title VI of the Federal Civil Rights Act of 1964 uh, states that no person in the United States shall on the ground of race, color, or national origin be excluded from participation and be denied the benefits or of subjected to discrimination under any program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. Further, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, commonly referred as 504, requires that no otherwise qualified individual with a disability shall, solely by reason of his or her disability, be excluded from the participation and be denied the benefits or be subjected to discrimination under any program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. So this extends to our Deaf and Hiring Hearing Community, and I would love to see that reflected in this bill as well. Um, we, we, I, I wanna then share a little bit about the experience of the HRC when thinking of language access. I came uh, two years ago, I started the job, and the entire team is very committed to this as is one of our uh, protected categories around national origin. And so we've been doing a lot of piece, piece and pieces around that. We did a video we to explain what the Human Rights Commission was. We translated that into 10 languages. A lot, a lot of our programs that we're doing, we're offering translation services. We just did a fabulous language justice panel, um, which we, if you're interested, I can send you the video and the caption so you can read through it. Uh, we brought together um, uh, Professor uh, John Peroni, who is from the University of Vermont, who you should have here to talk a little bit about the deaf and hard hearing community. Um, so he spoke, we brought uh, Odilia Romero, who is this amazing indigenous uh, person from Los Angeles who started an interpreting program for indigenous peoples in, in Los Angeles because we had that lack of problems. And she brings a very different perspective about what Senator White uh, was talking about, about the cultural component that you need to have. And the conversations around like in Spanish, for example, you have all these Latin American countries that have very different words for the same word. So um, you need to be able to understand that a little bit. Um, I also, so in here we, are, we have been working on looking at all of our applications condensing them so then we can have them translated. I'm in the process of doing that right now, uh, making sure that we don't have a Google Translate on our website, but that we have, uh, a, we're not gonna have the money to translate everything, but at least to be able to give the point to people to request it from us in any of the communication that we do. Um, and, and so I think it's a process and I, I, I see the bill thinking of that process and what agencies need to do, but I do think it's imperative. I, I see some of the agencies having Google Translate. Uh, Amila and Allison talked a little bit about that. It's not very good. Nobody should be using it. I had a conversation with some of the state agencies that, you know, it, something is better than nothing. And I said, no, you don't, you know, give her an apple. It, just because there is an apple, right? Like, so I don't think we should, we should really, have agencies be thinking about this. The Vermont Judiciary just created a language access plan in 2021. Um, I think it will be amazing to hear from them about this bill and, and what they're doing around the court system because they are they do have one person that is um, just for the Vermont Judiciary who's thinking about this, who created language access plan and who's in charge of that. Um, Amila talked about life-saving access and the examples of those services. I just wanna ask again, for us to think about deaf and hard of hearing 
when it comes to live site and access and you know radio and all of that stuff and like how are we going to get there um so the same conversations that we have and so overall i think i'm not going to repeat anything that everybody said but um I just want to say that we do need to put some resources. It does take a level of expertise, uh, editors that can like vouch through whatever is being said. And I, I think um, this is a great, great right step in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I just, I'm just going to make one comment that um, I know that um, deaf and hard of hearing children are eligible under 504 services, but I want to make um, sure we don't um, identify deaf and hard of hearing as a disability. We've had, we've done a lot of work in this committee with the deaf and hard of hearing community, and they will tell you that they, they are not disabled. They have a different language. Yeah. Thank you for, for saying that. And there's that conversation happening all over around yes yeah. yeah so um any questions for amanda um okay um i i liked your um well could i i'm sorry oh could, yes please please i mean this is sort of a, an easy question in a way but i'm wondering what kind of response you've gotten from different state agencies? I, I assume it very really, really varies from agency to agency, but I'm just wondering what, like what your take is on the openness of state agencies to work with you on these kinds of things. I think everybody, you know, wants to. I think it's a matter of resources, lack of understanding sometimes, um, uh, and yeah, pressure. So I, I, I don't think anybody, I think, Anybody's saying no, but I think they just need a little push. <laughs> we all need a little push for some things. This is True. one of these pushes. <laughs> I liked your comment about something is better than nothing, but a rotten apple isn't necessarily better than no apple. Exactly. I, no, I liked that. Thank you. Senator Clarkson. So of all the co uh, ARPA money resources we've heard lots about in this built in this figurative building that we're in and have been in for the last two years uh I, you know we I, I don't think i've heard other than allison's talk about getting money through the cdc I, I don't think i've heard any uh talk about the resources that must be available for this kind of work uh, with ARPA because the, the COVID need and all the things that needed to be communicated through that, I, I would assume we could find out uh, uh, what resources are available through joint fiscal and, 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 and apply some of them here. I mean, this is, it strikes and, me. Yeah, Amanda. Sorry, I just, I, you know, Allison's project, the language justice and the human rights commission said in many of those meetings, uh, I think there's one thing that is really important is that a lot of the services are concentrated in Chinden County. So the rest of the state who also have populations of people who don't speak English don't have that same access. So for example, in schools, um, Burlington School District and Winooski were, took all those videos and they were sending them to the schools through robocalls, right? Montpelier also has, and I live in Montpelier, this is what I know, we also have language access needs, but you know, that wasn't, you know, the resources, whether it's a district or whether whatever it is, like some of those districts are not thinking the same. So I think we need to think about when we're, even if it's one person that needs that access, if we are giving that access in Chinden County, we need to be able to extend that through our whole state. We have, um, yeah, because we because we all access the services of the state at one point or another, whether we live in Chinon County or not. Yeah. And most of us don't. <laughs> <laughs> or at least most of us here don't. <laughs> um, so any other questions or comments? I think that um, 
our next step in this, if you think this makes sense committee, is to, I know that um, Susanna Davis was working on a language access project. And I think the next step is to have her come in and talk to us. And we were going to have her come in today, but time, um, because of time constraints, it made sense for her to come in a, on another day um, to talk about where she is with that project and what's happening at the state level and how, how this um, bill fits into her project and complements it. Does that make sense? Yeah, that committee? makes sense. That makes yeah, good sense. Is Kimberly good. Frampton also coming in with her? Or is Kimberly what? Frampton? There what? was another witness listed here, Kim Kimberly Frampton. So Kim Kimberly. No, she was with the Association of Africans Living in Vermont. Right. Is she it, it, is she also well, well if we can have her come in if she wants to? But she was not necessarily connected to Susanna's project. It would be, I, Gail, there was a, a snafu yeah. where Amela wasn't um, on the original list. I don't know what happened with Kimberly. It, it would be good to have someone from AALV. I feel like they have done yeah. as much, if not more, interpretation services. They've done interpretation services for longer than USCRI. Mm -hmm. um, they are, you know, probably the, the biggest and longest provider. So whatever happened, it probably would still be good to hear from AALV. I don't know that it yeah. would differ that much, but they, again, Amila and AALV would be the most likely to be able to say, here's what the contract would need to look like. Here's what we need out of a relationship because right. no one else provides these services in such a large quantity right now. Yeah, I, we definitely will have, and, and everybody who is here today will also get an invite so that um, you can come. So if there are questions about it, but I think that, so we can look at how, how Susanna's um, project fits into this bill and how they complement each other and where there might need to be changes in the bill to complement her project. Because unfortunately, um, I'm sure as you know, Amanda, we deal in the details. <laughs> And um, we love the big concepts and the, the um, ideals, but when we write legislation, we have to actually get the details right. So if that makes sense, yes, Senator Collimore. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think based on some of the testimony today, we ought to have somebody come in from the Vermont Judiciary to, to uh, tell us about, they seem to be ahead in this more than some of the other branches. Good idea. That'll probably be Judge Zone. Um, yeah. Okay, great. Good idea. And I do now have a name from Amanda of somebody for ASL specifically, which would oh, be good. good. Yeah. Okay. Yes, because we have, in this committee, we've done nothing around other language except ASL. And that was, that was a very exciting project that we worked on. It was, and um, unfortunately, uh, I mean, it was exciting, but unfortunately it was the only time in the presentation of a bill in the Senate that there's ever been an interpreter mm -hmm. on the floor. It was, but anyway, okay, committee. So we will, um, Thank you, Amanda. Um, so I think committee will take, uh, we're scheduled to meet at, it says either three or 315, I don't remember, but we're gonna meet at 315. And what we're gonna do before we jump into, um, let's see, what is it we're jumping into? Mm -hmm. Look at my little chart is getting. Your favorite bill, the municipal bill. Oh yes, the municipal bill. And so Tucker will be with us, but, and right before we jump into that, I'd like us to look at the bill that we just got from the, that was sent to us from the house today. I think it was H693. It's one of those that we really need to get out pronto. We should have, I don't know, this is the Northeast Kingdom Solid Waste Management oh, District. Right, Remember right. they have this bizarre way of doing their, their budgets. Yeah. And we dealt with it last year when we did the, the um, 
budgeting, but for some reason it never, they never brought it to us this year. So for their, at the annual meeting issue. So I'd like us to, we did pass this exact language last year and I'd like us to just get it so that we can get it out if that makes sense. And Tucker is the drafter, so he'll be with us. Perfect. Okay, great. Thank you.